Hello. <coughs> Sorry, this is the end of a long tour, actually. Um, crossing the river by feeling the stones. Uh, how many people here know my form of mapping? All right, barely nobody. Uh, just a few, like 10%. All right, so we're going to go through an awful lot. I'm going to do it very quickly, and you're going to see a small part of what is a huge field. Uh, I better start uh, at the beginning. Where did this all start? Um, I used to work for this company, and it was called Fatango, online photo service, um, 16 different lines of business, about 10 million users. This is 2004, 2005. Very profitable. I had a problem. Uh, the problem was this person. Uh, this was our CEO. Um, they were utterly clueless. Uh, they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, they were a fake CEO. They were making it up as they went along. Now, I knew this because I was the CEO. <laughs> I mean, we, we had vision statements and all that sort of nonsense, uh, but uh, pretty much we were just copying everybody else. Um, so this is about my journey uh, from being totally useless to being somewhat, well, Mostly useless. So I started off with the issue of strategy. Uh, then I got into maps, and then I um, learned how to map a business, uh, which was useful for challenging what we were doing. And then I um, discovered we were often trapped by context. So I'm going to go through that. Uh, try to make a perfect map. Uh, that's a total uh, useless exercise. And then I learned loads of patterns, uh, which I'm going to then use to talk about principles, after which we'll get into the concept of co-evolution, after which we'll talk about what's going wrong with Agile, and then we'll get into culture. And we're going to do this all in an hour. You all right? <laughs> Gosh, this is ma If we don't, it, it, well, 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 there's beers outside. Um, so I'll start off with the issue of strategy. Um, for me, I started uh, uh, reading Sun Tzu. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? The Art of War. Super. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. One, have a purpose, a moral imperative. Two, understand the landscape you're competing in. Three, understand the climatic patterns and how that is impacting the landscape. Uh, then you get into doctrine, which are universal principles of organization and structure. And finally, you get into the leadership bit. I was quite excited by that. And then I came across John Boyd. Anybody know what John Boyd did? OODA loops, fantastic. The US Air Force pilot came up with the concept of OODA loops. So you have the game, that's your purpose. Uh, then you observe the environment, that's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. And then you orientate yourself around this. That's what doctrine is about. And then you decide where you're going to attack, and then you act. And it's a loop. And of course, the more you go around it, the better you get. So I was quite excited. I would show, show other CEOs this, and they would go, oh, it doesn't matter. Strategy is all about the importance of why. Well, there's a problem with that statement, because there are two whys. There's the why of purpose. That's your moral imperative, and the why of movement. And those are very, very different things. So, for example, if I'm playing a game of chess, my why of purpose might be to win the game. Why, my why of movement is, do I move this piece or that piece? Um, and it's through movement, actually, we, we learn. We learn moves, assuming we can perceive the environment. And that's a big thing. So as we go around the loop, we get better at the game, assuming, of course, we understand the landscape. If we can't see the landscape, then I'm afraid it's all gut fill. And that's where I was. Everything was just random gut fill, very profitable, very successful, had no idea why. So um, I, I decided, well, if I need to uh, observe the landscape, I better learn how to map. So I got into maps. So this is a map of a Roman city, um, a fairly basic one. Uh, we've got about 20 points of interest on the map. Uh, we've got at least uh, five uh, military uh, points of interest and also five residential areas. Now, if I describe each of those points, just a simple A to B between each one in 25 words, uh, that's approximately 20,000 words just to describe single journeys, A to B, this point to that point. If I want to do more complex journeys, like every single permutation possible, that's approximately that number of Wikipedias. I don't even know how big that number of Wikipedias is. And, 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 and 
you know, it gets even worse if I go, go off and start to explore some other part of the map as well. I, I don't, we, don't, I, we don't even have enough words. I certainly don't have enough space to put the number down. So basically, when people say to you, a picture's worth 10,000, it's worth a lot more, but it's worth a huge amount of words. Now, one of the things is that with a map like this, someone can give me a journey. Uh, if I want to go from there to there, go this route. And I can look at the map and say, I disagree with you. I think this might be a faster uh, path to go. And we can have a discussion and an argument over the map. And that's quite a powerful thing. Because normally, in business, what we use are stories. So for example, in navigation, a story would be to get to the Temple of Claudius, take a left of the Colosseum, etc., etc. But the problem is, when I challenge the story, I'm challenging the person, the storyteller as well, which is why this happens. Whenever you give me a story and I go, I disagree, bang, we're into conflict. Whereas if we put it down on a map, we can challenge the map and take the conflict away. So maps are ways of exploring, communicating, creating a shared understanding of a space, and also depersonalizing a discussion. So I like those things about maps. But what is a map? What actually is a map? So this is Folkestone, London, Dover. 115 kilometers, 124 kilometers. What do you think the distance is between Folkestone and Dover? Yes, 12 kilometers. Hey, um, what? <laughs> OK, um, because this is a graph, it's not a map. OK, these two graphs are identical. Now, I'm going to magically turn them into two maps. Ta da Now, those two maps are different. Did you see what I did? Anybody? <laughs> yes, I gave it a compass, an anchor. OK? Uh, the thing about a map is in a map, space has meaning, unlike in a graph, which means this doesn't make any sense to us in a mapping form. Perfectly makes sense in a graph form. That makes sense to us in a, a mapping form. So some maps are more right than others. And because it has meaning, it means we can explore other space as well. So what makes a map? Well. To explain this, I'm going to use uh, uh, Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general. Uh, I'm going to point in, out an example of where things go wrong and then explain why the map works. So Themistocles had a problem. Uh, the Persians were invading. About 140,000 to 170,000 Persians. We're not quite sure. Um, but what he decided to do was block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along a coastal road into Thermopylae. It's a narrow pass where a small number of troops could defend against a larger force. Now, there are about uh, ooh, 4,000 Greeks, including 300 Spartans. You've heard the story. Fantastic. Right. So I want you to imagine you're all members uh, uh, of the Athenian city-state, uh, independent city-state, all part of the Greek army. It's the eve of battle. I'm Themistocles. I'm giving you purpose and moral imperative. Uh, we must defend against the invading Persian hordes. And then I say to you, I don't have a map. I don't understand the landscape or the environment. But have no fear, for I have created a SWAT diagram. <laughs> Strengths, a well-trained Spartan army, high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave, uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up, opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans, we hate the Spartans, we're, we're Athenian, uh, threats, the Persians get rid of us, and the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. All right, so, so what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Position and movement described by a map or some sort of magic framework like a SWAT? A magic framework. I want to fight you every day. <laughs> Sounds like a football chart. Um, OK, and what do we use in business? A swap, right, super. Um, um, maps are fantastic environments for learning about spaces. Unfortunately, what we use are magic frameworks. Now, what makes a map a map is it's got an anchor. You've got position of pieces on a map relative to the anchor. And what you also have is movement. So if I want to go from Thermopylae to Thebes, what direction would I go? I 
southeast. If I go southeast from Thermopylae and I uh, end up, I, I, I don't know, at uh, Artemisium, what does that tell me? That's wrong. Compass is wrong, something like that. Okay, but it's more than just movement, it's consistency of movement. Okay, I, I need to be able to repeat that instruction and move from A to B. And that's quite important. And it works well with geographical maps uh, because the time of the journey is relatively uh, fast, or it's extremely fast, compared to the change in the landscape. Okay, so this is uh, Pangaea. Uh, 200 million years ago, very, very different world. So, for example, if I went from Thermopylae to Thebes following a path and I took 200 million years to actually, because I'm a very slow walker, uh, to actually get that distance, uh, the problem, other than the fact that I'll be long dead, is, uh, is, is that Thebes will have moved. Okay? <laughs> uh, in fact, I'll probably be heading back to Thermopylae. Um, so, so, so the problem here is when the time of journey gets close to the time of the landscaping change, uh, you actually uh, have to describe um, that movement in terms of a notion of change. All right? So in a map, space has meaning. This requires anchor, position, and consistency of movement. Very simple. OK, so what maps do we have in business? Do you have any maps in business? I have business process maps. I have mind maps. I have systems maps. You don't have those things. OK. Uh, things like this. Yes, and things like this, systems map. This is a systems map. Customer, photo storage, website, CRM, that sort of stuff. Now, I'm going to do something magical. I'm going to take a CRM box, and I'm going to move it. How has the map changed? It hasn't changed, yes. If I took an atlas and I shifted, I don't know, Sydney, and put it next to Brighton, would that actually change the atlas? Yes. Why do you, why do you think it doesn't change your hair? Because it's not a map, it's a graph. In fact, all the maps we have in business have one thing in common. Do you know what that is? They're all graphs, yes, exactly. Um, I'm afraid we keep using that word, and I'm afraid it doesn't mean what we think it means. So that's why we're back to gut feel. Um, and if you're going, oh, no, it can't be gut feel. You know, we're, we're more strategic than this. Uh, my, one of my favorite papers, Marcus Fitzer, Use of Variance Decomposition, Investigation of CEO Impacts, looked at 13,500 CEOs, uh, determined the impact was indistinguishable from random chance. <laughs> Basically, you can get anybody off the street, replace your board with them, you won't notice the difference. Uh, it's not a very popular paper. Um, but then if I look at the business press, it's fantastic. Uh, one of my favorite articles from Harvard Business Review, how earlobes can signify leadership potential. This is not an April Fool. This is a serious article written in November 2011 about the importance of earlobes for leadership. This is the sort of garbage that I have to deal with. Anyway, so now we get to how to map a business. Given the fact we have no maps, how do you actually go about mapping a business? So I start with a cup of tea, being who I am. And the first thing I need is an anchor. So we start off with like public, say, wants a cup of tea. Uh, there's more anchors than just the public. There's the business itself, needs to sell cups of tea. There could be government, regulators, all sorts of people. OK. Uh, but cup of tea needs things. It needs tea, it needs a cup, it needs hot water. Hot water needs things. It needs kettle, it needs cold water. Uh, a kettle needs things, it needs power. So what you've got is a chain of needs. All right, I've got anchor and a chain of needs. So what about position? Well, it turns out to the public, the cup of tea is more visible to them than the electricity you're using to power the kettle. So what you can do is order this in terms of visibility. Um, so you put the anchor at the top and order the chain of needs in terms of visibility. And that's what we call a partial ordered chain of needs. Uh, we'll put a bit of scaffolding on here. It's completely irrelevant, but it just makes people feel more comfortable for there to be a y-axis. Uh, we'll just put the value chain invisible, visible on the left-hand side. All right, so now I've got anchor and position. So what about movement? 
Well, do you remember I said like Pangaea 200 million years ago, and if uh, the time of the journey uh, approximates the time of change, you have to uh, measure or uh, describe movement in terms of a notion of change. Well, here's the problem in technology. Uh, it took 1,400 years for electricity to go from the Parthian battery to Tesla and Westinghouse utility provision of electricity. It's taken about 60 years for computing which means things are rapidly changing, or certainly within our lifetime, which means we have to measure in terms of the notion of change itself. So how do we do that? Well, quite simply, you go Parthian battery over there, uh, commodity stuff over there, easy. Well, so I thought. But how do you do this? I first started off with Everett Rogers' work. Have you heard of Everett Rogers? Diffusion of innovation? No? Made famous by Jeffrey Moore? Crossing the chasm? Have you heard of crossing the chasm? Yes? So basically, this is the uh, um, uh, non-cumulative form that uh, Moore uses. This is the original cumulative form. Adoption over time. Early adopters to laggards, OK? And what you've got is Jeffrey added a chasm, um, which is the early market to the mainstream. Okay. And I thought, well, this is simple. All I need to do now is measure what percentage adoption before you get some sort of transformational change in the actual market. That's simple. Uh, the problem is it doesn't work. It doesn't work because um, I used to go around asking people, do you think smartphones are a commodity? And people would go, no. And I'd go, great, how many people have smartphones? And about 90% of the hands would go up. And I'd go, OK. Are gold bars a commodity? And everybody would go, yes. And so I said, well, I'll ask you, how many of you have gold bars? Not many, OK? So, so you can't measure evolution in terms of diffusion. It's a bit like viruses. Viruses diffuse, but they also evolve through multiple waves of diffusion. Unfortunately, I'm a biologist, and so I knew that. So what's going on is you've got multiple waves of diffusion going on of a single instance of something. And I thought, well, that's great. That doesn't help me, because I can't even measure the applicable market now or time. So I was stuck. But fortunately, I'd collected 9,223 publications on the subject, and I noticed something funny. Telephones. When we started with the telephone, we used to do publications like this. The telephone and how we use it, how to hold it, how to speak into it. My favorite is this one. Do we do that today? No, but we did. So, so what's going on in the publications, I categorize them, is we start off with publications talking about the wonder of something, like the wonder of radio. Then publications change the frequency, and we talk about building construction awareness. Then we get into operation, maintenance, and feature differentiation. And finally, we just get into use. So the wonder of radio, bold mine crystal radio set, uh, how to look after my radio, and finally, the radio times. And this is common. So what I did was th realize that uncertainty was the key here. We become more certain about something. So built a certainty axis based upon the frequency of the publications, found the point of stability where we're no longer talking about how to operate, but simply how to use, went back and found the applicable market for all these different activities, and then plotted that against each other, ubiquity to certainty, overlaid the publication types, and voila. You get these stages of capital. Turns out capital evolves. Stage one, rare, poorly understood. Stage two, becoming more commonplace, well understood. Stage three, even more commonplace, even more well understood. It's all driven by demand and supply competition. But that's all meaningless. So what I did is I went back to the publication types and took labels for them for each of the different forms of capital. So when we're talking about activities, we talk about genesis, custom-built, products and rental, commodity and utility. When we talk about practices, novel, emerging, uh, good to best, data unmodeled, divergent, convergent, modeled, and even knowledge, concept of observation. Uh, then we move on to hypothesis, hypothesis, theory, and accepted. These are just labels for different stages of capital. All the stages of capital share the same characteristic. So it's that. 
You have something that appears, the genesis of something novel and new, custom-built product commodity. So, Parthian battery, Hippolyte Pixie, Siemens generators, Tesla Westinghouse, utility provision of electricity, or computing, Z3 1943, custom-built systems like Leo, Alliance Electronic Office, IBM 650, rental services, Timshare, commodity hardware, and then cloud. Really simple. So that is movement. So now I can map, finally. There I've got the anchor at the top, I've got position described through a chain of needs, I add the axis at the bottom, Genesis custom-built product commodity, simply place things where they should be, and now I have a map. So what? Well, it's a map, so I'm quite happy. So the first thing that happens is challenge. Once I have a map, somebody can look at my map and say, why is the kettle being custom built? And I go, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe we should use a standard kettle. Somebody else might go, oh, technical debt. OK, interesting. Uh, then somebody say, why are we missing a component? Like staff, didn't think of that. Oh, staff should be robots these days. All right, well, we can at least discuss that. And then somebody from finance can come and say, well, each of these are stocks of capital. Each of these lines are flows. So we can put figures on it and create a P&L for that particular line of business. And now we can work out what the, technical, what the cost of this technical debt is. Oh, that's great. And then somebody will come along and say, oh, but we have to do the custom-built kettle because it's all about brand exclusivity. Well, at least we've got a figure for what that's going to cost us now. And then somebody will go, what do you mean by brand exclusivity? Well, fortunately, I can not only map activities, uh, because they're different stages of capital, I can map knowledge, so, you know, and uh, I can map, for example, my field genetics, or, or we can... We can Combine the labels, so I can map ethical systems, political systems, social systems, and all this sort of stuff as well. So I'll use concepts emerging, convergent, accepted, put those at the bottom, and now we can go ethical trade. Where's that? How involved is that idea? Then we can go green, renewable energy, fair trade conditions. Now the point about this is that we can all sit there arguing over a map I normally just show it in those forms, by the way. I, I can't be bothered to use the different labels. Um, we can then put an intent. Our intent is to drive the kettle to more commodity usage. That's how we're going to change the system. And now what we've got on a single map is not only the anchors and capital flow and physical capital and missing components and ethical values and relationships and all the technical debt and our intent we can argue about it without the usual sort of fighting because somebody's created a story. And then the first thing we discover is that we're trapped by context. So this is an insurance company. Very simple. Um, have you heard of um, process flow here? Hands up. Fantastic, right. Process flow, compute need, order server, server, goods in, modify mount rack, compute needed. OK, very simple process flow for getting compute into the insurance company. They had a bottleneck. Have you heard of bottlenecks? Good, excellent. Right, so they had a bottleneck modifying mounting servers. Uh, so they put a plan together to invest robotics to do the modifications. It was about £2 million of capital, return investment sub one year, lots of SWOT diagrams, lots of stories. And the problem is you sat down looking at them and go, are you sure you need robots? And it's like, we need robots. It's in our story. So I got them to map it. This is a 15-minute exercise, and they took six, six months putting their case together. And so they went, user needs compute, OK? They've got computing product, I might disagree. Order server, server goods in, all sort of commodity stuff, fair enough. Compute needs rack, mount, modify. I'll leave that there for a second. Anybody notice anything funny with the map? Oh, why would the rack be custom built? That's the question I asked. Why have you got rack in custom built? And they said, we have custom built racks. Ah, so what are the modifications you're making to service? They don't fit our racks. So we have to take cases off and drill new holes and add new plates. Ah, and that's what you need robotics for, yes. Is there another way of doing this? <laughs> of course, by then the penny is dropping. The problem is, is all this is hidden away in stories, and of course, they go, oh, gosh, we should use standard racks. We don't need to have robotics then, do we? Fantastic. You see, their problem is this is evolutionary flow. 
And that's the one thing you must concentrate on. And what they were concentrating on was process flow. I see this all over the place. Projects, the scales of hundreds of millions, all optimizing the wrong thing, making highly ineffective systems more efficient because everybody's worried about bottlenecks and process flows. In this case, very simple. Stop using custom-built racks. And once you've done that, then somebody goes, oh, well, compute, it's not really a product, is it? No, it should be over here. It's a utility. It has been for ages. So that's the process flow they should be optimizing. That's the one they're doing instead. Does that make sense? Very simple. 15-minute discussion. All right, so now we get into perfection. How to create the perfect map. And the answer is you can't. That was simple. Uh, this is a map of France. Is it a perfect map of France? No. What, what, what scale would a perfect map of France be? One to one. So it'd be the size of France. It would therefore be France. Therefore, as a map, that's not much help. Okay? All maps are in perfect representation of the space. That's an imperfect representation of that space, which saved a few million. I've got examples which have saved hundreds of millions. My favorite are things like this, the RNLI where um, uh, James has been using mapping to reduce call-out time. We got it down from 14 minutes to 18 seconds. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you fall in the Thames, they were used to dragging out dead bodies. They're now actually saving lives. So this is, like, really fantastic. Uh, they reckon they're going to save about 1,000 lives a year in total. So anyway, back to for Tango. Uh, I took a systems diagram, gave it an anchor, the customer, described the chain of needs, gave it a map, and we, well, gave it a movement, and, and we had a map. And from that, we could work out what we needed to do as a company. Actually have a strategy for once. And now to explain how this works, I'm going to have to tell you about patterns. When you go back to the strategy cycle, if you can observe the landscape, you start to learn climactic patterns. And there's about 30 common economic patterns. Then you get into doctrine, 40 universally useful principles that we know of, and then you get into gameplay, manipulation of the market, over 100 of those. I'm just going to deal with the uh, climactic patterns, rules that influence the game. OK, very simple. Got a map. The first thing you learn is everything evolves. If there's supply and demand competition, it's moving from left to right. Doesn't matter what you want to do. If, it, if competition exists, it is moving. Now, as things evolve, do you remember I said many diffusion curves? They go through many chasms. Now, some of those chasms, uh, the particularly when we jump stage, are very strong. And we call those inertia barriers. And those inertia barriers are because of pre-existing capital. And that can be political capital, physical capital, you know, existing governance and practices which exist. Which is why when you go up to somebody and say, you don't need a data center anymore because you can get it all on a credit card. They look at the 400 million they've just spent on buying their new data center, the political impact it's going to have on them, explaining to the financial controller that they've wasted all this money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's about 16 different forms of inertia you have to worry about. So past success, unfortunately, also breeds inertia. So pre-existing business models is another form. And the classic example of that is blockbuster Netflix. Who was first with a website? Who was first with video ordering online? Blockbuster. Who was first with video streaming experiments? Blockbuster. Who went bankrupt first? Blockbuster. Right, so Blockbuster out-innovated absolutely everybody, including Netflix. And they went bankrupt first. Why? Pre-existing business model, late fees. All right, some of you won't remember late fees. Um, we used to have these things called video cassettes, which we used to get from a shop, and then we used to bring them back late, and that's how they made most of their money. Okay? And you don't get that in the streaming world. Very simple. Right, another one, Kodak. Because um, I was working for Canon, and we were competing against Kodak, and Cat was Cat. I know you mentioned Kodak. I can tell you the other side of the story, because we actually mapped it. They were all about sharing moments, analog images, fulfillment, camera. Well, we already knew that camera had evolved and we had digital still cameras, and this was industrializing, commoditizing images, and we saw that Kodak moved in there with online photos. They bought Ophoto. So they had online photos, and they actually owned digital still cameras. But here's the best thing. 
Their fulfillment made them most of their money, which is why they had inertia. All those mum and pup stores doing, you know, you know, video, you know, all the small little stores with the, the analog printers. Well, you, you, you used to take your film and you give it to them and you'd discover that half the pictures hadn't come out and that sort of thing. Do, do you remember that stuff? Yes? Well, some of you do. Right, so they had a huge amount. So what they did is they invented photo printers. Brilliant. These are, the idea of the photo printer, uh, it was going to save Kodak. Uh, what, what else it was going to do was it connected digital still cameras to analog images, because you could now have a digital still camera which you could print out an analog image from. Wasn't that fantastic? Except for we were running uh, for Tango, and so we noticed everybody was using camera phones, and no one was actually printing any pictures anymore. So the point about this is um, what Kodak actually did is they bet their entire future on something which had no chance of success. And in fact, we already knew it had no chance of success uh, when they were betting their future on it. So we were smiling. Anyway, um, <laughs> of course, uh, you know, they'll probably tell you what they didn't know. Uh, <laughs> everybody else did. Um, so inertia kills. That's the other, another pan. Um, another one is that as things evolve, efficiency enables innovation. So like electricity enables, well, I don't know, radio television, which evolves, or like computing evolves, enable higher order systems. And that's componentization, Herbert Simon's theory of hierarchy, pretty straightforward. Uh, this is what we call the adjacent unexplored. It's uncertain, unexpected. You don't know what's going to succeed in that space. You have to gamble. Ear be dragons. All right. Uh, the one advantage is those higher order systems create new sources of value and worth as well. So you don't know what's going to succeed. Is it going to be the refrigeration blanket or the television? Um, it turns out it's the television. I would have bet on the refrigeration blanket. But, but, uh, uh, but you do know that those, that stuff at the top is where new value is created. And so that's good from investment. So from a point of investment, when I'm looking at a market, I'm going, do I want to, you know, these are fairly well-known, understood transitions, so we can invest here, or we can try and differentiate here, or take a total gamble on something novel and new. But at least now we're talking about the market and where we're putting our bets. And of course, the sensible thing, don't, don't mess around with the process flow. Don't concentrate on optimizing this when something's evolving, because this will always tank that. All make sense? Pretty straightforward? Super. So then you get into the leadership bit. So gameplay. So there's about 30 common economic patterns, great for uh, anticipation, M&A, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, leadership is great fun as well. This is the bit where we start manipulating markets. So there's context-specific forms of gameplay. And there's about 100 of these. Um, so back in 2005, when we did this map, we knew we could accelerate this process using an open approach. Uh, uh, open source is a very context-specific play. It will tend to drive things to a more industrialized state. It doesn't matter on the left-hand side whether it's open or propriety. But certainly, if you want to drive things, undermine a competitor, it's fantastic. Um, but there's a, another play, number two. It's called ILC. If you take a product, turn it into a utility, we'll say compute, and we'll call it, say, we'll pick a name. We'll call it Amazon EC2, just randomly. Um, <laughs> and other people build on top, OK? Well, um, the thing is that they act as your free research and development department. Because you, can, you don't look at their data. Their data is their data. You can't touch that. But if, let's say you're all doing big data, and you're doing kit and internet. What I notice is you kitten interneters aren't using much of my service, but you big data people are. So it use, it's just by looking at consumption of my service, I can see what's becoming popular. And then I mine that and to create a new component service. We'll call it, I don't know, uh, um, say DynamoDB. And of course, some of you go, you've eaten my business model. Sorry about that. And now, but you're cheering because you're now building new things on top, now with new, two new services. Now, the point about this, is I get everybody else to innovate for me. I mine the metadata um, uh, to spot future patterns. I commoditize to an ever-growing platform of services. Uh, hence, innovate, leverage, commoditize. It's very powerful uh, because my rate of innovation, customer focus, and efficiency now all increase with the size of the ecosystem. I, the more people build on top of me, the more innovative, customer focus, efficient I get.
Make sense? Any guesses for any sort of company who might be doing something similar to that? <laughs> Everybody going, God, they're, they're getting more innovative, more customer focused, more efficient, and they keep on eating our business models. Any, any guesses? Yeah, yeah. You, you've got a guess. Can I ask who who you? Amazon. Oh, that's an, that's an interesting idea. Um, so is their ecosystem getting bigger? Yeah, so do you think they're going to be easier or harder next year? Harder. And how about the year after? Much harder. <laughs> and it just goes on. It's a bit sad, really. Um, but it, it's really easy to counter, but most people don't understand how to. So anyway, this is what uh, the sim that symbol represents. And so you go compute machine learning engines, machine learning... You know, this is what they're doing. They're just moving up the stack on the right-hand side, industrializing the space. Uh, same as China government. So most of my stuff is nation-state nation competition. And uh, the China's brilliant at it. I mean, poor US has not a clue. But um, so, so China's, uh, this is the automotive industry, tearing it up. Um, they've been doing it for about 20 years. Really good stuff. Anyway, so that's my map. Uh, and so that's what we decided to do in 2005, industrialize the uh, runtime to a utility, build an ecosystem model moving up, using that ILC model, having an open play. Um, but I suspected someone was going to launch a uh, utility version of compute. Um, so we didn't want to be in any of this stuff. Um, someone would launch. I thought it was going to be Google. It was uh, Amazon the next year. So we would build on top of them. And that was it. That was the play. And that's what we did. And that was for Tango. For Tango, um, we went from a systems diagram uh, to creating a map to all coming together, working out how to attack the market and build the world's first serverless environment in 2005, called Zimkey. Have you heard of it? No. No, that's because we had a bunch of very expensive management consultants come over from the US and tell the parent company there were three things we were doing, mobile phones as cameras, 3D printing, and cloud were not the future. The future was, in fact, 3D television, and we should shut it all down and spend a billion dollars on 3D TV. How many of you own a 3D TV? How many of you use? Oh, I'm glad there's somebody. The billion, <laughs> that billion was all for you, sir. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and do you use it? No, right, uh, OK. <laughs> Disappointing. So then I started doing all sorts of stuff with government and Ubuntu and other people and things like that. So um, uh, anyway, I want to jump onto principles because that's doctrine. And there's 40 of these. Uh, we've done about five climactic patterns. Uh, the principles are universally useful. Um, so efficiency enables innovation, pretty straightforward. Uh, higher order systems create new sources of worth. The, the, these are climactic patterns, pretty straightforward. So what you've got is things evolve, become more efficient, enable things to appear, which then evolve themselves. Now, when they evolve, their characteristics change. So it doesn't matter, money, penicillin, computing, who cares? Start off in this uncharted space, chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable, exciting. It always ends up over here, industrialized, ordered, standard, known, boring, dull, etc. Okay, now the reason why this is important is because in 2003, uh, Kent Beck's a friend of mine, and we'd adopted extreme programming in my organization. And I'd done the really dumb thing, really daft. I, I made every mistake there is. Uh, I said, right, we're going all agile. And so we went all agile. And of course, by about 2004, we realized it doesn't work. Um, what we found out was uh, extreme programming, agile, in-house development, very strong over here. It's terrible over here compared to things like Six Sigma and outsourcing, um, because here you need to reduce the cost of change. Here you need to reduce deviation. And they're both pretty useless in the middle compared to learning and, and reducing waste. So more Scrum, MVP, and all that sort of stuff comes into play. So what we learned is no one size fits all. Uh, so that was about 2005. Of course, every time I go to a conference, it doesn't matter which one. If it's an agile conference, I go, not agile everywhere. Then everybody goes, burn him, heretic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I go to a Six Sigma conference, do the same, not Six Sigma everywhere, burn him, heretic. Uh, same with Lean. Go on, then. <laughs> yeah, th thank you. Um, it's the same with um, um, purchasing. So time material, VC focused, outcome based, more cots, more unit utility. You have to have multiple purchasing uh, methods to actually effectively manage something. So I'll give you an example, HS2 high speed rail. Uh, a friend of mine, James Finley, um, 
We needed to build the entire railway in a virtual world, first of all, because uh, it's cheaper to dig up a virtual world and go, whoops, we got that wrong, uh, than it is to dig up the actual countryside. So that is the systems diagram. Here's James's problem. Should I outsource it all? Should I use uh, off-the-shelf products? Should I build in-house with agile techniques? Or should I use a combination of all three? Now, the problem with the combination, and this is a systems diagram, not a map, is there are 387 million possible permutations of that answer. So which one do you pick? So uh, just an afternoon, Sunday, sat down, had a cup of tea, maps it out. There we are. There's the map. It's really simple now. Uh, stuff on the right-hand side, you outsource. Stuff on the middle, you off-the-shelf products. Stuff on the left-hand side, agile in-house techniques. Does that make sense? It's really simple. And then, of course, all of this stuff will evolve. And as it evolves, you change methods. All right. So that was 2012. Uh, vendors hated it. I absolutely hated it. Um, and the reason why is vendors don't like you to map because they want you to think of it as one whole thing and outsource the whole lot. And they want you to outsource the whole lot because they know you'll want a contract. Because you know, you're like, I want to know what I'm getting delivered for my 300, 400 million. OK, fair enough. The problem is, is you can specify the stuff on the right. So that stuff will be efficiently treated. Everybody will be happy. And here's the good news for the vendors. You can't specify the stuff on the left, which is why it will incur excessive change control costs. So your 300 million pound project will become 400, will become 500 million before you know it. They absolutely love this stuff. OK, and the best bit is you're at fault. Because when it comes to the argument about how comes my project's 500 million, they can just point to all the things that were efficiently delivered and then say all the stuff that had a problem was because you didn't know what you wanted and you didn't specify it right. You, didn't, you can't specify it right. Uh, unfortunately, what always happens is some muppet on your own side comes up with the idea of next time we need to specify it better. <laughs> and uh, there you are. Yeah, yeah, it's You'll just lose more money. Right, so um, uh, two principles come out of this. One, think small, use appropriate methods. Very simple. There's a list of 40. All of this stuff is Creative Commons and has been for the last 14 years. So you just help yourself. OK, so we into co-evolution now. Anybody heard of serverless? Yes. yes. Anybody heard of DevOps? Right, you all know DevOps is the new legacy, yes? <laughs> Do you want to know why DevOps is the new legacy? OK, we'll go through the history of computing. Early stages of computing applications built directly into compute. OK, this stuff evolved like everything else evolves. As, as it evolved, we got systems like Leo, Lions Electronic Office. From this, we built operating systems. This stuff then evolved. And then we got our first products, things like the IBM 650. Now, these products had a characteristic. We call it high MTTR, high mean time to recovery. So what that means is when my server went bang, it would take me months to get a new one, which is why I did things like capacity planning, M plus one, disaster recovery techniques. Do you remember this stuff? Yes? Great. So we developed what's called novel architectural practice. This is called coevolution. Practice often evolves with the actual activity itself. Or as uh, in social theory, competence with the material. This stuff then would evolve. So eventually, a new faction was born around this good architectural practice, novel, emerging, good, and best, for the use of computers as a product. Uh, we gave it names, and we used to run around laughing at people who hadn't done their capacity planning, like your email server ran out of space. Does anybody remember those days? Right, good. And so we got language frameworks, applications, emerging coding frameworks, runtime, operating system. All this stuff evolved. It was there. We were all happy, concentrating on process flow, how to make these systems more efficient. And then the big, bad, evil thing happened, cloud. That is cloud, the entire history of cloud. It's just a shift of compute from product to utility, nothing more. But it has a big impact. It changes the characteristic. We go from high to low MTTR, which means we have a new novel emerging practice. So no longer, no longer you know, 
scale up, capacity planning, M plus one. We can distribute systems, design for failure, chaos engines, continuous deployment. We could do continuous deployment in the old world. It just took three months for the machine to turn up. That was it. Now it took seconds, OK? And what happened is, uh, of course, uh, some CEO said, make my stuff cloudy and legacy, put it on Amazon. Amazon had an outage because it's a low MTTR environment. It's about massive numbers, quickly available machines. It's not like the super resilient single machine. And so people would run around screaming, the end of cloud is nigh, to which you would go, shouldn't our architecture evolve as well? And they would go, burn him, heretic. Does anybody remember 2008, 2009, those days? Yes, good. Right. These people had inertia because they had best architectural practice for a product world. They're right for the product world, but they have inertia to this change because we've got a different practice. We had a novel to emerging practice for the utility world. Eventually, that evolved, and eventually, we gave it a flag, a name. Uh, and two friends of mine, Andy and Patrick, they called it DevOps. Yay. And we ran around saying it's all about user needs, iterative development, etc. And the old crowd would go, so was ITIL. And we would go, burn them, heretic. <laughs> that sort of thing. Yes, it's all factions. Social practice theory. I'm, I'm starting to really like this stuff. I've got, I've got to say thanks to uh, Jane and, and Chris as well. Thank you very much. Um, if you take that map, if you're into social practice theory, material at the bottom, two different competencies with a single meaning of architecture. And there are two different competencies, one which is currently good practice for use of compute as a utility, and one which is best practice for use of compute as a product. Of course, that we now call legacy, OK? Now, I worked at Ubuntu, uh, and we, we, we basically, uh, with 3% of the operating system market, up against Red Hat, Microsoft, cost me half a million. We took 70% of all cloud computing in 18 months. Uh, using maps, pretty straightforward. Uh, wipe, them, wipe the floor with them. Uh, great fun. I love that sort of stuff. Anyway, so operating systems become more of a commodity. And now the runtime itself, uh, uh, this is Lambda, is becoming more of a utility as well. Have you heard of AWS Lambda? Anybody tried coding with it? Yes? What do you think? All right. Oh, dear, oh, dear. OK, you'll, you'll get there. But um, <laughs> what we've got is a new emerging practice up here. So people like iRobot, 23 million robots in the wild. Uh, how many people, what do you think their IT bill is a month for 23 million robots? The guess. $15,000. Eight people, 23 million robots in the wild. Those are the rumbas. You know the rumbas? They're all communicating back, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So you've got a new emerging practice appearing over here. And, you know, so the material change, Two competencies, same meaning in terms of coding practice, but fundamentally different. That's what's going on. And all that stuff behind the inertia barriers. Uh, so best practice for the old product-based runtime, LAMP stack, .NET, and all that sort of stuff. And everything down here is all legacy, including ta -da! <laughs> DevOps. Of course, if you go to a DevOps conference, which I do, and go, DevOps is the new legacy, they will go, burn him, heretic. <laughs> OK, so you get these debates. Anybody seen these debates? Containers versus serverless? Yes, these fights. Oh, it's hilarious. You know, two tribes regarded each other suspicious. I don't like to use of the word tribe. I prefer faction. In the glow of their brightly blazing production environments. Uh, so basically, what's happening is a whole bunch of people are concentrating on things like, have you heard of Kubernetes? Oh, what a waste of space. So they're all concentrating on op improving operational imp improvement down here. Oh, it's, but, and that's going on. Okay? Concentrate on evolutionary flow first, process flow second. So all the stuff below the line is just going to be we won't care about. It's all becoming invisible. Uh, Kubernetes, containers, oh, doesn't matter. And then people say, but 12,000 people can't be wrong. Um, look, crikey. 100,000 people told us, oh, Ubuntu will never take over the cloud. It took us 18 months. So yeah, if 100,000 people can be wrong, 12,000 easy any day of the week. 
All right. So now let's get on to Agile. Got 12 minutes left. Whoa. Scaffolding. Uh, I said it was scaffolding, so let's get rid of it. Uh, let's just, just use the evolution axis. So here we have, so I started off, I, I, I know Kent, so we we'll started off pretty early with extreme programming. It's a sort of evolved. There, there's, there's Agile as in XP. Uh, really good for stuff over here. And we'll call it a thing. Uh, we call it what we like, kit and internet. So if I'm building, or teleportation, if I'm building the world's first ever thingamajig that no one's ever done before, agile, extreme programming, great, love it. Um, but of course, this thing will evolve. And as it evolves, I'm going to change. I'm going to eventually have an understanding of what I'm going to do. I'll start including other artifacts. I might, you know, I'll have an MVP. Uh, I'll use you know, other methods like Scrum, etc. And of course, as it evolves, I'm going to change my method again. Uh, now it's industrialized. I'm mass producing kitten internet or teleportation machines or whatever it happens to be. So, so my method will change. Now all of these methods are evolving. So you know, them, they're evolving, but they also apply to different contexts. Does that make sense? Are you sure? OK. So what you've got is the meaning is the same. Uh, it's, a, say, a project method. But you've got different competencies, as in Agile, Lean, Six Sigma. And the meaning of the thing I'm trying to build is the same, uh, but I've got different materials. And those competencies are best for each of those materials. Does that make sense? Good. Right. So, um, so this is why you use multiple methods. Uh, but what goes wrong, and it, hap it happened with Six Sigma as well, it's going on with Agile at the moment, is somebody comes along and thinks, I'll make Agile suitable for each of those different contexts. OK? Well, we'll, we'll make it work everywhere. Despite, despite the fact these are polar opposite and these are different characteristics in the middle anyway, so it's, it's like you're trying to do the impossible, and we're going to have another go. They did it with Six Sigma as well. And then what happens is they do it by co-opting other competencies and other techniques and including it in their technique. But those other competencies are suited to elsewhere. So what happens is you end up with this horrendous mess. And, and you use it and you fail. And somebody tells you you used the wrong bits of it. Has anybody come across that? You say, oh, well, you, well, which bits should I have used then? Can you tell me before I get started which bits I'm supposed to? Oh, you use the whole method. I went wrong. We use the wrong bits then. So, so now, so now, so now, you know, this is a way of blaming the person, not the process, and that's about as anti-agile as you can get. I'm afraid agile is becoming anti-agile in its current format. I love Dave Snowden's talk earlier today. Absolutely spot on. Does that all make sense? You have to learn that Agile is suited to a certain context. I had this with government. I wrote the Better for Less paper for Francis Moore with Liam Maxwell and others. Um, and, and within a couple of years, we had the tyranny of the Agile. And it's not suited to absolutely everywhere. But it's an incredibly powerful technique which is suited to specific areas. OK? So, culture. Oh, I've got seven minutes left. Are you coping? You want me to keep on going? Keep going. Yeah, are you sure? Okay. Right, well, normally at this time, people go, this is all too complex, just give me an agile culture. I hear this all the time. People say, can't we just be like Spotify? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes me laugh. All right, so I, I said about uh, you can map ethical values, uh, concept emerging, convergent, accepted, you can map, map knowledge as well. So if I take something like universal basic income, paid holiday, unionization, um, and uh, has uh, derived from anti-discrimination law, civil rights, workers' rights movement in the US, uh, as Martin Luther King called the two pillars of democracy, uh, both of them uh, descended from the abolition of slavery. Uh, on this side, it was the Knights of Labor movement in the, uh, in, in the US, which led to the workers' rights movement. And, and those are descended from uh, other concepts or, or values of equality and freedom. Uh, some of it comes from the, the Quaker movement as well. Um, 
All of this stuff, by the way, is evolving. So it doesn't matter which one I pick, all of them started over here as concepts, emerging, convergent, became accepted. And you know, generally in this point, they get expressed in law. So, so they're universally accepted in society. Um, now what I'm gonna do is just highlight the ones at the top. It's different for the US. Uh, they don't have paid holiday in the United States. Uh, they do, do within the United Kingdom. Oh, well, there's, there's no legal right to paid holiday in the US. Okay, so what we've got is what we call a, ch a, a pipeline of values. So you've got constantly appearing values which over time industrialize, and we normally forget about the ones underneath. So when you're mapping out legal systems, oh, you know, we forget about all the, the, the precedents down here. We're just concentrated at the top. Okay, so you've got many collectives. Um, and you all belong to many collectives, a family, uh, maybe, uh, maybe an organization you work for, maybe uh, a, a political party, uh, maybe a local sports team or something along those lines. Um, all those collectives have some sort of values. Uh, maybe most organizations are terribly poor expressing values, uh, values of beliefs. Uh, most of the time what they value or say they value is action um, as in principles. So if you look at something like Amazon, they go, you know, we believe in user needs. Well, you can't, you know, focus on user needs is not actually a belief. It's a universally useful principle that everybody should do. But anyway, um, and actually, once you rip out all those universally useful principles, you actually get to the core values of the organization, which is always an interesting exercise. Anyway, these collectives are in competition with each other, usually. And we define success of a collective by how far its uh, values diffuse. So we've got a pipeline of collectives, i.e. many collectives you belong to, some more evolved than others, pipeline of values, some more evolved than others, all in competition with each other. We define success through that diffusion. I, if you're a member of a church and your values don't spread anywhere, it's not a very successful church. Um, that requires enablement systems. Uh, again, a pipeline, that could be a town hall meeting, it could be a local newsletter, it could be propaganda, it could be a democratic system. Uh, principles are important. These are these universally useful principles. There's about 40 of them because they actually impact your efficiency as a collective. And then what you also have is the memory of the collective as well. And the principles need to be applied to that uh, specific landscape. Um, and by, by uh, memory, it means that when you've got a collective, they build up rituals, myths, and stories, and everything else. All right, you also have gameplay. Um, now, gameplay is an interesting one when you're in competition with each other people. You can change the market slightly. Of course, what you do will become embedded in memory, and you are somewhat limited by the values of the organization. So you c if you're, one of your key values is transparency and honesty, uh, doing misdirection techniques is, is not very helpful if you get discovered. Um, collective, obviously, you've got belonging to a collective, and from that we also get aspects of safety. Um, Usually we want safety from other collectives, but there's also psychological safety as well, and of course that's influenced by memory and the principles that you operate by as well. Um, then we've got responsibility in the middle, which is connected to the collective that you belong to, and your responsibility for spreading those values, and the safety that is created by, by others spreading those values. And then you've got the many. So the many are ge general population, generally want uh, control, not, not individual control, but control as a group over where things are going. Uh, hence, we like to belong to collectives. And then you've got the few, and we've got individuals, and individuals generally want agency. I, they want more than just uh, the group to have general control, they want to have specific control themselves. Um, and uh, it, it's always interesting, sorry, side, this whole collective individual debate is always interesting because you can be heavily manipulated through education. Um, one of my favorite studies, uh, a bunch of Romanian student, students. Uh, this is um, mainly more collective before they did their three-year uh, economics degree. And by the end of it, we radicalized them even more. So uh, I made them more individualistic. So, so you, people can be manipulated uh, and shift, naturally as a species, we're quite collective and social, um, but you can manipulate people's perceptions and turn them into more individualistic. And the, the reason why you do that is people are much easier to control, despite the fact they think they've got power, if they're acting as individuals. 
Uh, and of course, individuals, you need structures in order to control that. So, so this here is basically a visualization of what we call culture. It's an imperfect, all maps are imperfect representations of things, um, but this is what culture is, which is roughly why we have over 170 definitions of culture and nobody can properly explain it because it's not a simple thing. It takes somewhere in the region about 7,000 words to put that into a way that you would understand without a map. Does that make sense? Good, right. So what? Why care? Well, um, you can't just copy. You can't just go to an organization and say, oh, look at their values, look at their principles, we'll just copy them and we will be Spotify. Uh, because you're missing all the issues in terms of the enablement systems, uh, the memory within the organization, and all those other components. So it's even it's really difficult to, to copy the culture of one organization to another. But there's lots of good stuff you can do because there's lots of beneficial cycles in here. You know, if your collective succeeds and helps and spreads their values, etc., you get a greater sense of um, safety or memory of your, your collective becoming stronger, which improves your safety and your sense of belonging to the collective. So there's lots of cycles that you can use in positive and also negative ways. You can actually use it to do destabilize structures as well. And you can also nudge culture. Uh, introduction of artificial competition and things like that. A great way, oh, we're all fearful, they're coming into our space, is a great way of nudging a culture. Uh, you can also adopt principles. Of course, they'll, they'll change your culture in a different way to the originating organization. Uh, again, there's about 40 universally useful principles that are all online, help yourself. Um, and you can also influence with gameplay. Now, you have to be careful with gameplay because you can influence in positive and negative ways. Um, so I said there's a hundred and over a hundred different ways of manipulating a market. Here's just a few. Education, bundling, creating artificial needs, confusion of choice, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I just picked some. Um, some of these are fairly neutral. Some of them are what we call lawful evil. So um, I'm an old D&D &D player. Uh, lawful evil is, oh, they're a bit naughty but nice sort of thing. It's uh, a bit bad if you do them. Uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, creating a confusion of choice, a bit naughty. Some of them are downright evil. Um, so chaotic evil, we call them. Uh, signal dis uh, distortion, pig in a poke. This is uh, dressing up something as though it's the future, uh, despite the fact you know it isn't. Uh, and the problem with these is if you use them, and you're discovered, uh, because they oppose, if they oppose your values, it really depends on your organization. Because if your organization doesn't care, and it's just totally, well, you can get away with doing anything you like. But uh, uh, in an organization which might have you know, values of honesty and transparency and things like that, it can be a real problem because it can become embedded in memory of the organization and the myths and the stories. And of course, as you loop around the cycle, that's going to limit your future options as well. Anyway, quick recap. Um, we went from strategy all the way to culture via maps, which most people don't use, which is great. Uh, how to map a business, uh, um, how you can use them to challenge what you're doing, why people get trapped by context, uh, how there are lots of different patterns out there, uh, collect, um, climactic patterns, doctrine, and, and gameplay. Uh, so climactic patterns, universe, uh, that they, they are ones which will happen to you regardless of what you do. Um, the doctrine are universally useful patterns, um, which you don't have to use, but they're universally useful, so you should do, and, and gameplay are context-specific. Then we got into practice and co-evolution of practice, talked about agile and the problems going on with agile, and then eventually ended up a culture. Um, all maps are imperfect representations of the space. No such thing as a perfect map, so don't worry about it. Um, but they are good for challenging and getting people to communicate a problem in a um, non-political way. So, so we can have quite difficult discussions about Kettle or Brexit or <laughs> whatever we wish. Um, they're also good for identifying where to invest, uh, so useful in M&A type stuff as well. Great for straight, uh, gameplay and getting everybody sharing their ideas to create a way of attacking a market. Also good for getting rid of all these horrible vendor problems, which they'll stitch you over with um, by using multiple methods and techniques. Uh, 
I, I like doing that sort of stuff as well. Um, but uh, they're also useful for exploring, uh, understanding, and manipulating uh, cultures and, uh, and other systems. Um, Titor was crossing the river by feeding the stones. Um, pretty simple, Deng Xiaoping, fantastic economist. I totally recommend reading his stuff. Um, obviously, he's passed away. Um, he, crossing the river by uh, feeding the stones is have purpose, have direction, um, take small steps, understand the landscape as you go. Really important to understand that landscape. Or as J.R.R. Tolkien said uh, before he wrote the book, I wisely started with a map rather than just diving into a great big story. Thank you very much.